Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. The Ghost of Lincoln. Written by Hamster IV. Macron 7 Orbital Trade Station. Former head of security, Alex Daravan of the Dengot. Interview by Imperial Inquisitor of the Human Incident. They were fast, not fast like covering distance in a short time. I'm talking about mentally fast. Pattern matching, threat analysis, ballistic computation, fine motor control. The humans had our speed in all these areas. In the time it takes a human to walk through a doorway, they can catalog the species of every creature in the room, identify who is most likely to retaliate first, and aim one of those primitive death sticks at the poor fool best position to oppose the human's entrance. I saw this scene repeated over and over as the humans liberated the orbital trade hub of Macron 7. My security station captured footage of boarding craft no bigger than torpedoes burrow their way through the station's hull to disgorge their deadly payload. Had the humans packed those torpedoes with explosives, it would have caused less damage. We were equipped to deal with hull breaches, but a coordinated band of fast-moving apex predators loose in our station was beyond our ability and training. Our main security forces were equipped to deal with a slaver's vault or a drunken merchantman. Synth armor and scattered cannons were more than sufficient to deal with all previous challenges. The marine contingent provided by the Navy had grown fat and complacent from their easy posting. I swear those soldiers received more combat training from bar fights than through formal drill by their officers. The Navy system's defense fleet was supposed to prevent such a calamity from ever reaching our station. Unfortunately, the same advantages that made humans so dominant in infantry combat made them staggeringly lethal in space. Tiny craft, only large enough to provide life support for one creature, wove through our defensive line, making a mockery of our gunners. No creature can outrun a laser, but the humans could track the long barrels of our laser cannons and make course adjustments to ensure that the path of their craft never intersected the line of destruction our cannons carved into empty space. The acrobatics they pulled would have turned our pilots to paste, yet... The humans just shrugged off radical acceleration changes as if they were born on the event horizon of a black hole. But inside, our defense forces formations, those laser cannons could do nothing with the automatic IFF, identify friend or foe, safeties in place. The human crafts matched speed to attach thermal bombs to our ship's hulls before leaving those insidious devices to burn through the armor and ignite the oxygen supply. I deleted the footage from the flagship's last moments. No one should have to see that again. Only after every weapon capable of breaching a hull had been permanently silenced did the humans jump in their transports. These ships were a motley collection of various client species of our own empire. The humans had obviously co-opted and murdered their crew to get their derelicts to turn on their rightful masters. Without any spaceborne defenses... We were powerless to stop them surrounding our station and launching the aforementioned boarding torpedoes. Our entire marine detachment deployed itself into the docking bay. By the time we realized the attackers had made their other arrangements to board our station, the humans had found a way of venting the docking bay's atmosphere. The fleet's so-called finest went out into the void to join their equally ineffective defense screen. As for my security teams, the humans blew past barricades like they weren't even there. A cunning ambush from a hidden security stations on the main concourse barely managed to incapacitate three of our attackers before their fellows spun around and dispatched my officers with contemptuous ease. What was worse, the fallen humans were quickly revived with the bare minimum of medical attention. I saw one who had lost an arm get up and walk away. The invaders ignored the stockrooms full of rare minerals and precious metals, heading instead for the slave pens. 
I saw the human slaves emerge from the general stock when they recognized the creatures who were slaughtering their overseers. These slaves ran forth and mashed their disgusting faces into the armored faceplates of their liberators. I assumed it was some sort of barbaric reaching ritual. What shocked me was watching members of other slave species get up to perform a similar ritual. Upon review of earlier footage, these non-human specimens had spent a great deal of time around the slave humans and had uh, pack-bonded, for lack of a better term. One may have even used a trusted position to broadcast our station's cargo to these bipedal killing machines. The warrior humans did not discriminate between humans and non-human slaves. Instead, they marched the entire content of the slave pens through the merchant district, looting food, garments, and technology as they went. Slaves, too injured or sick to stand, were carried by the warriors, who were all happy to pulver our medical stalls on their behalf. It took the better part of a day for the motley host to pressurize the docking bay and relocate the slave population to the waiting ships. In that time, the humans vandalized all that they did not steal. Take a look at this, for example. At this point in the interview, the former chief of security points his well-worn scrub brush to a crudely drawn figure. It depicts a top of a stylized human head peering over a wall, an oversized nose, one four stubby digits dangle over the wall. A hat, consisting of a tall rectangle with a bottom line over it extending to form a brim, completes the character. Below the wall reads the text, The Ghost of Lincoln is watching. End of story. Story number two. Introversion because... Why not? Written by the Robot Apocalypse. Human Zara, where are you going? Zara turned and looked at her co-worker. She had been trained in a system far from the Terran core world that was something of the galactic hub. For fifty years now, the colony of Rosland had been big enough to merit its own university. And even though all species were technically allowed, Rexclians were rarely seen in either the university or the city. Their appearance was slightly comical, with large out-of-proportion eyes and four arm-like manipulators, in addition to their two legs, and a height equal to roughly half of Zara's own. The Rexclian, given the name Rox Utha, repeated their question, their voice now slightly panicked, Where are you going? To my chamber, replied Zara, while keeping a neutral tone. Of course, there would be an awkward exchange. Why wouldn't there be? Please, be over soon. Why? I, I need to be alone. Are you angry? Do you need medical aid? Do you need to engage in sexual intercourse? Ox Eartha rattled off the reasons that they thought the humans needed to be alone. They needed to know why the human was leaving the lounge space so soon. Didn't they like being with others? But she, Rox Eartha, believed that they were female, not like them. The other crew members had left them alone to get something, and after a few moments of protracted silence, human Zara had politely taken leave and made for her chambers. Clearly, displeased by something Roxolther had done. Please, don't hate me. Please, don't hate me, they thought to themselves, as they waited for the human's answer. Zara was a little taken back by this tirade. Nevertheless, she answered calmly, mostly because she didn't have the energy to actually react, or give a decent explanation. No, I'm just tired. She hates me. When a human says I'm tired, it usually is an excuse to get out of an unpleasant situation. Okay, said Roxolther, dejection, or what passed for it in her species passed over their face. Bye, Lara mumbled, and quickly retreated to her room. She had hoped for peace after a long and exhausting day, but with that last exchange, her brain kicked into overdrive. What did I do wrong? Did they hate me now? Did they think that I'm grumpy McGrumpy, or worse, a perv? She sighed. Rest would be a long time in coming. Rock's author eventually made their way back to the lounge, where the human Ahmed was browsing through something on his tablet. Look, Roxy, they have finally put that fucked up serial killer in prison. Solitary isolation, too. Why would they do that? Rock's author might be tight-lipped around the human, but they certainly weren't shy with Ahmed. Well, uh, 
Humans have a need for social interaction, you know, regular contact with others. Being locked away alone is basically like torture for us. It is the worst form of punishment that we can classify as humane. So we stick the feckers with it. Rox author's eyes widened. You mean to say that, that, that being alone is literally torture for you? Yes. What crime did human Zara commit? Did you tell her to lock herself in her chambers? Why is she being punished? Calm down. Okay. What the feck are you talking about? Human Zara locked herself in her chamber. Is she punishing herself for something? I seriously doubt that that's the case. Must be something else. My girlfriend saw she chose torture over staying in the break room with me. Why does she hate me, Ahmed? Hey, chill out, okay? I'll go check it out. Did you find out why human Zara is subjecting herself to torture? I did. And she is an introvert. Is that a crime? Ahmed let out a snort. <laughs> it means that she needs time alone, regularly. But isn't that painful? N not to her. I it's refreshing. Roxy was having a hard time digesting this information. Why were humans so contradictory? And why did they have to have not one, but two on the crew? Human Ahmed liked talking to them. He didn't run from them. Oh, and Roxy. Yes? Don't disturb her if she's reading. Why? More human rules. They were going to burst with the stress. As I said, she's an introvert, as I've been informed through very recent experience. If you come between her and her book, it will result in a lot of cursing, insults to your lineage, and a surprisingly hands-on introduction to the effective adaptation of human nails as weapons. Do you need an ice pack for your face? That would be nice, sir. Thank you. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click, click, click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just quickly want to thank the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Ken Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gusta, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joe Kambaka.